You're listening to The Naked Pravda. This is Medusa's first and only English language podcast, so please don't be shy about recommending us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in. Welcome to The Naked Pravda, a podcast that highlights how Medusa's top reporting intersects with the wider research and expertise that exists about Russia. I am your host, Kevin Rothrock, the managing editor of Medusa's English Language Edition, and on today's show, we will be talking about coronavirus in Russia, where as of March 19th, officials have officially recorded nearly 200 cases of the disease and at least one fatality. Those numbers are sure to go up by the time this is published, by the time you're listening to this. There will undoubtedly be higher numbers. As a living human being listening to this podcast now, you are no doubt aware that a virus known as COVID-19 is now devastating the world economy and killing thousands of people all across the planet while forcing millions, maybe billions of people to remain at home and distance themselves socially to contain the spread of this illness. Even though I've always worked from home, the COVID crisis has affected me too. I can no longer see the latest Vin Diesel action movie in a movie theater because they're all closed. I tried to order some ground beef from Whole Foods the other day, and they sent me a disgusting maple syrup-soaked pack of bacon. And my children are home from school and daycare, as those vital facilities are now shuttered and I assume gone forever. In other news, it's Friday, baby, so crack open a cold one, sit back, relax, and let the soothing sounds of my voice and my guests' voices wash over your disease-ridden ears as we discuss the history and capacity of Russia's healthcare system in the face of a pandemic. You'll also hear from a handful of folks now on the ground in Moscow, where things are still remarkably calm, it seems. So where to begin? Medusa has reported extensively on Russia's coronavirus outbreak, but one text that stands out is our interview with Vladimir Kolin, or Kalin, probably Kolin. He's the CEO of DNA Technologies, a Russian company that's designed its own coronavirus test, but it's currently navigating federal regulations to begin trial studies. But before we talk about Russia's healthcare bureaucracy, let's take a minute to understand how a coronavirus test actually works. I needed more than a minute to wrap my head around this, and it wasn't until I spoke to an epidemiologist at Yale University that I began to understand vaguely what's involved here. Coronavirus, like many viruses that cause colds, have a structure in which the genes are encoded not on DNA as in all living creatures, but in RNA. That's Robert Heimer, a professor of epidemiology and pharmacology at Yale University. I spoke to him over the phone, even though in all my years of podcasting, this was actually my first guest who also lives in New Haven, Connecticut. But thanks to social distancing, of course, the interview couldn't take place safely face to face. So I called him on the phone. We talked on Skype. Here's how Dr. Heimer explains the method used to detect COVID-19's presence in a human body. Coronaviruses happen to be a relatively small RNA, positive-stranded, single-stranded RNA genome that um, in order for us to detect the presence of the virus, we have to detect the presence of the RNA in people. To do that, we take a swab uh, of the throat is the best place. If you can't get a throat swab, you want both an, a mouth and a nasal swab, but better to go down into the throat, even though it annoys people to do that, and get a swab. You then take this swab and extract from it uh, the RNA molecule, um, which is not going to be there in wide abundance. So in order to detect it, you have to amplify it. We amplify it using a, a technique that's been around since the 1980s called nucleic acid amplification. This technique was originally invented to amplify DNA, 
So the first thing you have to do when you have RNA is convert the RNA into a complementary DNA copy, and then you amplify the DNA from that. So it's a two-step process to detect viral RNA. First, you make a DNA copy, then you use that DNA copy to make millions and millions of copies of DNA, which is easily detected. This can all be automated. It can be done um, in the process of an hour or so once you have the sample in a lab with the capability to extract the RNA safely and efficiently um, from, a, from a throat um, oral or a nasal swab. Okay, so you do all that, and you've got yourself a coronavirus test. As of earlier this week, with Russia leaning on a test kit developed by the Novosibirsk state-owned research center Vector, healthcare officials had managed to test about 100,000 people for the virus, with fewer than 200 people testing positive. Judith Twigg, a political science professor at Virginia Commonwealth University who's worked on health systems reform in Russia, says these numbers are bad, Low down, dirty, rotten, no good, bad, bad numbers. The number of reported cases in Russia is nowhere near the number of real cases in Russia. We have good reason to believe that the testing that they've done doesn't all have the required sensitivity. So there have been a lot of false negatives, I bet. Dr. Heimer also warned that numbers of confirmed cases at this stage in Russia shouldn't be read as an indication of the current situation. In this phase of an epidemic, what you know now is not where you are, it's where you were. Dr. Heimer also explained the problems we've seen with coronavirus tests and how some can be more sensitive than others. In many cases, he said, the people running the test simply mishandle patients' samples. But there are also less efficient ways to design the test itself. The science here, even he admits, gets a little harder to explain. In order to make a complementary DNA copy or to amplify DNA, you start with very short primers that bind to your sequence of interest, and you ask enzymes to fill out the gaps, which they can do because of the complementary nature of new, the way nucleic acids work. Uh, basically, each strand is, a, is an inverse, sort of a, 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 a mirror copy of the other. And... Um, so if you have one strand, you can make the other strand if you've got something to a short sequence of bases to build off of. Those are called primers. If your primers are not well designed, you won't amplify very well. And therefore, you can have false negatives for that reason as well. Judith Twigg says Russia's numbers are unreliable also because the parameters for testing and the lack of seriousness about social distancing ensure that coronavirus will continue to spread. They're just not testing everybody who ought to be tested. They, like a lot of other places, still have some fairly restrictive guidelines around whom they're testing. So they, again, like just about everybody else in the world, is operating without complete information. And therefore, they're not identifying all of the cases of people who should be self-quarantining right now. They're not practicing social distancing with the proper evidence base to get the messaging out to the places it really needs to get. Dr. Twigg says there are also reliability issues with the reporting system itself. Given the command structure in Russia, it's often not in your interest as a healthcare provider to acknowledge that something like coronavirus is killing your patients. In this system of vertical control, there are plenty of disincentives to being the bearer of bad news. So there are lots of incentives for people at the facility level, people at the local and regional government levels. You know, if we look back at TB, HIV, you know, health numbers in general, lots of incentives not to report bad news up the chain. So I, I worry about the overall information environment and, and the extent to which people are feeling comfortable reporting bad news when when they find it in their local environments. This isn't just speculation. Dr. Twigg says we know how this works because we've seen it happen with Russia's attempt to crack down on tuberculosis, as ordered in one of Vladimir Putin's so-called May decrees. They started looking closely at mortality rates for tuberculosis and set targets for reduction in TB mortality. And as I'm sure you know, when you get HIV, the most common opportunistic infection that actually kills you is tuberculosis. That's true, not just in Russia, but all over the world. And so there are issues about 
what happens to the coding of cause of death when somebody who's HIV positive and suffering from AIDS dies from tuberculosis? Do you code that cause of death as tuberculosis or HIV AIDS? And as soon as they started tracking and paying attention closely at the federal level with targets set at the regional and local levels for reductions in TB mortality, all of a sudden we saw an increase in reported deaths from HIV AIDS. And guaranteed that's because people were just shifting the way they coded those causes of death. So that kind of playing around with data at the local level casts a shadow over all of the information that they're, that we're getting reported through those administrative hierarchies. So I, I think there's reason to question in the information regimes across the board. My name is Shauna. It's spelled with a C, but it's pronounced like an S. Shauna. Shauna works as a private tutor in Moscow. She told me that she hasn't received any information directly from city officials about coronavirus. But she mentioned getting text messages a few years ago about strong winds that knocked down a bunch of trees. And she regularly receives messages about severe weather. I've gotten not a single text from the, from the city or anyone about the coronavirus. Would you say that you, you're getting... You've, you've been noti- you get more notifications about like severe weather than you do about... Oh, 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. It's noticeable, though, like on the metro, it's noticeable. There are less people on the metro. I was traveling tonight at 6.30, 6.45, prime time, and there was... You could move around. <laughs> you couldn't sit, but you could move around. It was a noticeable drop in ridership. Although uh, there's still only standing room sometimes. Yeah, still. Yeah, absolutely. Still only standing room. <laughs> Like today, for example, um, I would say there was easily people within two feet of me, so not not that far apart. And more people wearing masks, too. A significant amount of people have started wearing masks. Okay, let's get back to Russia's regulatory hurdles in the development of new coronavirus tests. DNA Technologies has apparently created something better than the test now in use, but it's tied up in red tape. Judith Twigg explains how something like this is possible at a time like this. That's the overall downside of the vertical control of the vertical system is that you have a lot of bureaucracy, a huge amount of red tape around these permissions. So the big one permission that's needed to release the viral samples that the companies need in order to develop and verify the new tests. So, yeah, that's that's going to be an issue across the board. Dr. Twigg says Russia might show a little more flexibility going forward, however. There have been some hints that they're going to be willing to bend on some of this or loosen up some of these regulatory environments. Putin's even said a couple of words just in the last couple of days about relaxing some of the import restrictions on foreign made drugs and medical equipment. Ah, yes. Russia's policy of import substitution, replacing foreign imports with domestic production the autarkic economic way forward for a nation besieged and encircled by a hostile West. The head of DNA Technologies says about a fifth of their coronavirus test relies on imported components. But he also told Medusa that Russia might find itself in a global crisis situation where no foreign countries will export any medical products or equipment, meaning that Russia's attempts to boost self-sufficiency might actually pay off. But not everyone agrees with this assessment. It strikes me as being much more of a vulnerability. That's Harley Balzer, a professor emeritus of government and international affairs at Georgetown University. He's currently writing a book about Russia and China and the global economy. What a time for a book like that, eh? Dr. Balzer doesn't think much of Russia's progress with import substitution. They talk a lot about import substitution. We have not seen a lot of evidence of it happening. Roughly two-thirds of the inputs that Russian industry uses are from abroad, and about half of those come from China. The worst in the high-end electronics, something like 95% of Russia's high-tech stuff is still being imported. Where are they getting them with the sanctions? Uh, Some of it from China, uh, some of it probably illegally from Israel and Europe, some of it maybe other black market stuff. But that's not a reliable supply for the long term or for a crisis.
this brings us back to our discussion about the capacity of Russia's healthcare system in the growing coronavirus crisis. It's the same debate now playing out in countries across the world as people desperately try to slow the virus to keep hospitals from being overwhelmed. Dr. Heimer says the odds are against a smooth ride in Russia. So much of the Russian medical system is based on a dispensary system and an inpatient hospital system that doesn't have the capacity to deal with large volume. People are made to sit around and wait in waiting rooms to see medical professionals. If these facilities remain open for any length of time and people with the coronavirus start appearing at these facilities, there will be large spread of the virus among healthcare personnel, which is going to disable the healthcare system. Much of Dr. Heimer's expertise on Russia's health system focuses on efforts to curb the spread of HIV AIDS. Having seen the infrastructure in place for this fight, he says hospitals aren't ready for something like he says hospitals are not ready for something like COVID-19. I've been in HIV uh, and, and infectious disease inpatient facilities. There's no way those are equipped to deal with a contagious airborne virus like this coronavirus. Dr. Twig has observed roughly the same vulnerabilities, warning that Russia's healthcare bench isn't very deep. If you look at the Russian government statistics or even the OECD statistics on healthcare capacity, it looks like compared with the United States, compared with Western Europe, it looks like they have a relatively high per capita number of hospital beds, number of hospital facilities, number of doctors. But the quality of all those things is pretty low. This is another case where they've got a handful of really great people and a handful of really great facilities, but it drops off quickly. The bench just isn't very deep. And so it's not going to take too many cases to completely overwhelm what they can deliver with both uh, infrastructure and equipment and personnel in emergency rooms and intensive care units. While Russia's hospitals are about to be tested in ways that now threaten to break healthcare systems in Europe and the United States, Harley Balzer warns that dangerous social trends found in places like America, such as resistance to social distancing, are also a risk in Russia. Russians, unfortunately, are a lot like Americans. They want their freedom, especially the young people. And if they're out partying and interacting, that's going to increase the risk of the spread of the virus. Dr. Balzer points out that coronavirus isn't Russia's only crisis today. The ruble is in free fall. As I record this, you need almost 80 rubles to buy one single US dollar. The last time the currency really tanked, and I mean really tanked, was in the 1998 financial crisis. But the depreciation actually helped kickstart the economy. That's unlikely to happen now. Anybody who had dollars or the ability to do it, or any Russian producer who had the ability to make something and sell it, could do really well. The Russians could undercut foreign imports. The inverse of the import substitution is that that means that Russian producers, even if they can produce competitive products, they're not going to have much except the Russian market for selling them. You know, Russia is not going to get the foreign investment this time that it got last time that would help the low price producers generate output that would be competitive either inside Russia or globally. And that, that's going to be a big difference. As it is for millions of people around the world, the economic slowdown is directly affecting ordinary people in Russia. Anna is a freelancer in Moscow. Her first day on a new job was supposed to be this last Monday, but the office called and told her to stay home. I, I haven't even signed a contract yet. So uh, as a freelancer, I'm pretty sure I don't have any like uh, paid days off or uh, leave or whatever you, you call it. So however much I've worked, that's the amount that I get at the end of the month. They had to make an exception and asked me to stay at home uh, and work from home, which um, isn't perfect really uh, for them, nor for me uh, right now. But uh, we kind of have to make it work. Vasily is another freelancer in Moscow. He says business is still OK for him for now. But he and his wife are bracing themselves 
for what's ahead. I'm a freelancer, and so I haven't really had to adapt too much. And also, like, because my wife runs a business and I'm a freelancer and I have to find work for the time while I'm going to be quarantined, which is presumably going to happen sooner or later. Uh, to do that, I have to set things up to be able to do that. So I have to have a couple more meetings. My wife has to, she has a business that makes food that is potentially able to be delivered. So she has to, it is like important that she continues running her business. So we haven't had to adapt our lives too much. And also we calculated the risk a little bit and we decided to continue until the kindergartens closed down to continue sending our daughter there. We don't have a cushion of money to tide us over for a few months. We have to continue working and making money for ourselves, for our kids. And it's going to be weird and hard in the last, next few months, I think. So we're trying to do as much as we can before it like really hits. So what about, have you gotten any like emails or text messages from the city? Like I wonder, because I'm here in New Haven right now in Connecticut, and I've been getting all these desperate emails from the mayor saying like, please don't take your kids to playgrounds, like, don't go anywhere, like, or else I'm going to, you know, lock you all down. Are you getting any messages like that? Last week was weird because this whole thing started really breaking out and it was becoming obvious that this is going to be a bigger story than most people thought. And uh, there's, like, the screens in the subway uh, that also share tips sometimes, and sometimes, and, and they also are, like, they're like these uh, weird internet videos that are cut into this screen that goes on a loop. And, like, it discusses important topics of the day. Shauna told me that she's seen these video screens on the subway, too. And it so happens that they've featured a certain Donald Trump quite prominently. Actually, I've seen a lot talk about, like, what's happening in America, the American part of it. And, and you know, Trump's on the screens talking about the what's happening in the U.S. But I, I haven't seen that much directly related to what's happening here, other than it's, it's happening in the world, if that makes any sense. You know, like, this is world news, not necessarily directly Russia-Moscow news. Vasily describes the videos on the monitors in Moscow's subway as a kind of clumsy public service announcement. But if they were designed to be at all comforting, they are not. It says, what do you think of the coronavirus? Are you scared? Uh, which is unsettling because, yeah, I am scared. I don't want to be reminded of that every single time. It, it isn't very, like, productive. But there's a lot of things happening in the news. But I don't think, like, most people, I think, think it's bullshit because nobody is really pushing that hard that it's that bad. Because I think that... Mm, the government is trying not to start a panic, but people have been buying things uh, very quickly uh, and it's kind of hard to get, like it takes several days to get food delivered instead of like immediately, like, how, which is how it was very recently. Uh, but yeah, we're not really getting that much communication about that. With all this going on and apparently a lot more on the horizon, I asked Vasily to name the most unexpected change he's experienced since the coronavirus outbreak. It turns out, as he's scrambling to prepare himself and his family for the hardships ahead, what stands out is something quite simple. I stopped hugging people, and it really sucks because I love to hug people. I'm really a, a friendly guy, and when I meet people, I'm keeping a distance, and I've had to stop hugging. And I know it sounds trivial, but for it, considering that it's like kind of part of my whole... Uh, lifestyle, it really is jarring to notice how lacking it is. You've been listening to The Naked Pravda, a podcast that highlights how Medusa's top reporting intersects with the wider research and expertise that exists about Russia. On today's show, we looked at Russia's capacity to tackle the spread of coronavirus, and we talked to people on the ground in Moscow who are trying to navigate life in the city amid a pandemic. On future episodes of this show, we'll be discussing queer Russian language science fiction and euphemisms in Russian media reporting on disasters. The Naked Pravda is a podcast from Medusa, our first English language show, and I hope you'll recommend us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in to help put this program in front of more people. Thanks for listening and come back soon. Mm -hmm.